Hey hey, Mark S. House with you here, and this week has been hugely exciting my friends, catching up on all the colossal upgrades at Starbase Texas, and this big news on the colossal central steel plate, just as one example. SpaceX shoots its Falcon 9 on its first ever mission destined for Lagrange Point 2. Yes, the Euclid mission was a total spectacle, but will it finally shed some light onto dark matter? Diving right into that, we discover a big scientific splash thanks to gravitational waves, ingenuity is still alive on Mars and much more is packed right into this very video, so let's jump into it. So cast your mind back to last week's video and you may remember that concrete pour that had over 130 truckloads dumped into the Orbital Launch Mount Foundation. This week it was time to repeat that, but first let's just look at exactly what the first pour achieved. With his flyover after the first pour, RGV Aerial Photography was able to give us some neat insights. Underneath these orange covers there, we can see some of the concrete peeking through. Why exactly didn't they fill this area with concrete? Well, those areas are for the three water deluge manifold pipes. These have been designed in such a way that they will be buried beneath the surface once the full deluge steel plate has been fully finished. SpaceX, of course, still aims to have maximum accessibility underneath the launch mount, not only for potential needed Raptor engine swap outs, but also for general maintenance. Before the second huge concrete pour could commence, SpaceX first did this smaller pour just as last week's video was going live. That was most likely to cover these two patches further away and to give the crew full access to the actual pad once it was sufficiently cured. A few days later, though, the big event. Four concrete pumps arrived, set up, and there we go, the second big pour had begun. About 15 hours later, and with just over 170 concrete trucks offloaded, they were done for the day. This was all done in preparation for the installation of the water deluge system, or as the workers seem to call it, the pancake. Would you believe that this massive centerpiece that SpaceX moved over just last weekend has already been lifted and placed down? Just check this out. On Wednesday, it was rolled in vertically using the self-propelled modular transporter. They then hooked one side of the support frame to the yellow crane lovingly nicknamed Grover, and then the SpaceX crane on the other side. Together, they slowly and carefully guided it down onto its final resting position. The workers made some final adjustments, ensuring that everything lined up on the pipe stands, and it was finally secured and both cranes disconnected. Yes, the first piece of the puzzle was now in place, and the next day, the temporary lifting beams had been lifted out. So this is obviously only one piece in the full system. It still requires the three manifolds to be attached to supply all of that water. Believe it or not, those two made an appearance at the launch site. The smallest of the set had quite a lengthy deluge pipe still attached to it. I guess they realized that this would make the transportation a lot harder, so they simply cut that off. First, the two smaller manifolds were transported together in the rain, and that night, the third also made its way over. Now, how exactly are these manifold pieces going to be lifted in place? Unlike the huge centre section, these don't have clear access from above. The launch mount ring is in the way, but take a look here. These installation beams were added on top, which will allow the workers to place down counterweights at the other end. Again, Ryan Hansen here shows this beautifully, and it's really going to improve the crane access. I've got the full awesome thread by Ryan on Twitter linked in the description, by the way. Certainly worth a look. So this just leaves one key question. How will all these sections be welded together? Well, during the rollout of the first two, Starship Gazer captured a very neat bit of detail here, showing that the bottom horizontal plate is actually longer than the top plate. This is going to allow the team to first weld this bottom plate to the center, and also secure it to the embeds in the concrete. Once that's done, they'll add any remaining vertical pieces, and the sides will be welded together. Finally, an extra strip will be added at the top to fully close it all off. Now, just to polish off this particular part of the story, would you believe that just in the past day, SpaceX were already in the process of installing the manifolds? This system is a first of its kind, and I just can't wait to see it being tested out, hopefully over the coming few weeks. Okay, so let's pan our cameras slightly upward and look at the orbital launch mount itself, because work has been busy here as well. This week, they have been removing a lot of the scaffolding built up around the mount, providing some pretty good evidence that all of the repair and upgrade tasks are being wrapped up. 
it had also provided the added space to lift that ginormous centre deluge plate down. At the top of the mount, the reassembly continues with the reinstallation of the booster stabilisation pins. These, if you don't recall, give SpaceX the capability to very precisely guide the booster onto the exact position required. This stops any movement of the booster and it allows it to be accurately placed down onto the 20 hold down clamps. Further up the Mechazilla Tower, more great news continues. The ship quick disconnect was spotted being lifted back up onto its position on the arm. When it was removed, we thought that it was simply to allow them to conduct repairs and upgrades easier from the ground level, but once installed, it was very obvious that there was much more to it. Just take notice of the difference between these two pictures. Yes, that makes it fairly obvious, doesn't it? The ship quick disconnect has been moved even further upward. This is most certainly to give them plenty of headroom for the hot staging modifications that they are planning to do already with Booster 9 and Ship 25. Funnily enough, this wasn't the first time that they moved the quick disconnect upwards. The first time was between Ship 20 and Ship 24. In that case, it was positioned upward by one ring. That move at the time was most likely to simplify the plumbing on the vehicle and to make enough room for the future starships to accommodate six Raptor vacuum engines. Sadly, we still to this day haven't seen any ship in the pipeline with that engine layout. In fact, the only hint that they are keeping this idea in the back of their minds is that the recent potential hot staging ring had cutouts for six engines. Although we believe this to be scrapped, speculation suggests that we are likely to see another new, tougher version of this section soon. Speaking of hot staging, give it up for Hayes Grey Art who released an animation this week that was just gorgeous. As was described by Elon, you can see the three central engines will remain lit and powered down while the Starship engines ignite and accelerate the second stage away. After separation, it's currently unknown if those three booster engines would shut down or just keep firing. These three can of course gimbal and help flip the booster around for the boost back burn, but this is a little speculative still at this point. Do support Hayes Grey Art by checking out the full video from the description. I've just shown a few snippets here as a teaser really, so thanks for subscribing and helping them out there. That makes a big difference just as it does here on this channel. So over at the build site, action continues rapidly as well. First stop, the high bay. Ship 28 is still continuing to get attention, and after a little time with no payload bay door, it was now time this week to lift a door back in. Thanks to Starship Gazer, we've now got a really great look at the reinforcements on the inside. So let's take a look at the factory making the parts for these vehicles. Yes, the Star Factory. The expansion here is coming along rather nicely with more and more roof segments being lifted. This is just how the Star Factory in Florida was built actually, and it's nice to see the gaps in the concrete floor being tidied up, along with the remaining space around the pit, which we still assume is for a die press. Let's head down the road to the Massey's test site. The nose cone testing jail is now being reconfigured for the new test article currently being made inside the high bay. This, we still believe, relates to testing out the PEZ dispenser door strength through all simulated stages of a real flight. Close by, we also have the cryo stations for both the ship and booster, with the latter now looking almost completely finished. It almost begs the question which vehicle would go here next. Well, just as we were getting this video ready to go live, Booster 10 was making its way down there from the rocket garden. It is awesome news to see the Massey's test site slowly but surely ramping up to become the main test site. Here we expect to see the testing campaigns for both future ships and boosters, and this means only static fires and actual launches will be done at the launch site. As we rapidly count down to the second flight test, huge thanks to Tony Bella selling his amazing 420 flight patch design exclusively with us here. You can still pick up this design on a range of merch below, and this is the last week that we're going to be selling this one. What do you want to see in the next new design? Let us know below. So one of the main stories this week is really focused on the Euclid mission launched by Falcon 9 last Saturday. There is two parts to this. Firstly, the incredible mission itself for the telescope, but also some pretty remarkable changes about this particular Falcon 9 flight. More on that shortly, but real quick, I've just got to share some of the new technology in a browser that I must admit I haven't checked out for quite a while. The new version of the browser Opera 1 is here. It has had some huge changes since I last used it, 
as my main browser, but it is certainly an incredible tool for us tech fans. It has all the privacy stuff that you want built right into it, blocking ads and trackers, which makes browsing the internet snappier, safer, and overall it just seems less intrusive. The absolute best feature for me, which caught my attention right away, was the inbuilt AI tools. Maybe like me, you've tinkered with ChatGPT and found that impressive. Well, Aria, which is built right into Opera here, is using OpenAI technology and couples it with live web search results. After using that a bunch while integrated right into the side panel, I found that even more impressive. Another terrific feature that I love is the integration right with the Messenger applications. Check this out. I've got Twitter right here, and it's just pinned there in the frame. The same goes for Telegram, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and other popular messages as well, all fully integrated in the Opera browser's sidebar. You can call, chat, send messages, and share media without any extensions, separate tabs, or Messenger apps. It's really cool. Also built right in is this snapshot tool. No other software required. You can just fully control the region that you want to capture. You can then pull out that Twitter or Messenger tab and just paste it right in there. You can also, of course, capture full screen for a quick snap of all that you see. So why wait? Download Opera One, the new version of the browser. By supporting them, you are supporting my channel here too. Try it out from the link in the description or the pinned comment below. Thank you, Opera. So yes, this particular Falcon 9 flight was pretty remarkable. ESA's Euclid telescope had been delivered to Florida quite some time ago for its final tests and checkouts prior to launch. These telescope missions are always quite nail-biting. Also, did you see this? SpaceX's camera footage was incredible in this flight. There was a typical nice shot of Space Launch Complex 40 from the booster camera, but that isn't the amazing bit. Let's fast forward right through Max-Q and all the way up to stage separation, and we get this. Look at this amazing clarity from the second stage camera. The crispy quality here blew all of us away. Let's just compare that camera to a similar view from an older flight. This is a significant change, isn't it? And one that I can tell you is a very welcome one. Hopefully, we're going to see this clarity on all cameras eventually. Now, the telescope between the fairings here is so sensitive that a simple mistake can destroy the entire mission. Just one example would be if the telescope itself got into a spin and ended up pointing directly at the sun. That would immediately fry the instruments inside. It has sun shields on it, of course, to protect it from light when operating correctly, but there is also automatic fallback protections in place so that if the telescope does rotate towards the sun, it will still be protected. The incredible telescope is going to take about 30 days from its launch to get to its destination at Lagrange Point 2. Now, interestingly, this is the first time that SpaceX has ever delivered a payload to this specific orbit. To shoot the payload all the way up there, just check out the second burn of the Merlin vacuum engine kicking off right here. The speed starts off just under 27,000 kilometers per hour, and after a huge burn lasting around a minute and a half, the speed was bumped all the way to just over 38,000 kilometers per hour. Yes, the speed that you need to climb out of Earth's gravity well is significant. At 41 minutes into the mission, the telescope separated and it is now on its way by itself to Lagrange Point 2, around 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth here, the same location in fact that the James Webb Space Telescope is currently sitting. It is a terrific spot for these telescopes to be because the gravitational pull of the Sun, Earth and the Moon combine together. They all add up in such a way to create a stable position, naturally keeping the telescope at the same relative point as the Earth orbits the Sun. Other than infrequent small adjustments to keep it in place, it can sit right here for years. It faces outward, of course, so that the bright objects, the Sun, Earth, and the Moon, all sit constantly behind it. An unobstructed view of the cosmos, and it's going to be spending its six-year mission peering into the so-called dark side of the universe. Why? Well, it is all down to trying to better understand why our current model of the universe predicts the existence of dark matter and dark energy. And it's not just a little amount either. Scientists believe that this elusive form of matter makes up roughly 95% of all matter in the universe, even though we've never been able to directly observe it. It is thought to be the driving force that accelerates the expansion of the universe, and Euclid is going to examine the 10 billion years of cosmic history as it peers into the deep 
dark, scanning over about a third of the sky and mapping the shape and distribution of over a billion galaxies. That is just nuts when you think about it. It's got instruments to measure both visible light and infrared, and I for one cannot wait to see the first pictures sent home. I just can't get enough of this sort of cosmic research. Just recently, scientists were announcing that the universe is humming with gravitational waves. Not fast waves that we've observed multiple times in past years, but this time astonishingly low frequency gravitational waves. Waves so long that they stretch right across the very fabric of spacetime, ever so delicately influencing the rhythmic flashes emitted by pulsars. Just like celestial timekeepers, these pulsars hold the key to unlocking a bunch of secrets hidden in our vast universe. Yes, we've figured out that we can use this pulsar network as a monumental telescope spanning galaxies. This, as we've now determined, provides glimpses into the incredible origins of these captivating waves. It is just fascinating, and I recommend this video by Matt and PBS Spacetime to get a super in-depth understanding of exactly how this came about. The link to that is in the description below. Now let's just go and take a look at the red planet for just a moment. NASA's Ingenuity Mars helicopter has completed its 52nd successful flight. Now it actually performed this flight back on April the 27th, so why is this surprising now? It turns out that hilly terrain has been obstructing the communications between the helicopter and the Perseverance rover, causing a temporary communication blackout for about two months. Now, we actually had no idea of its success until just recently. Fortunately though, on June the 28th, as the Perseverance rover moved forward to clear the hilly region, communication between the two was restored. With a positive set of data returned, also indicating ingenuity was A-OK, -okay, the team anticipates another another flight within the next few weeks. Flight 53's target is an interim airfield to the west, and this will lead to further exploration near a rocky outcrop that has piqued the interest of the Perseverance team, so looking forward to some more exciting stuff from this great little helicopter. Now, you may remember just a few weeks ago, I talked about the James Webb Space Telescope helping scientists to study these water plumes from Saturn's moon Enceladus. Well, that certainly wasn't the end of the magic from Saturn, because this magnificent telescope is back in action bringing light to Saturn's rings. These are always an incredible sight, I think, a favourite in the night sky simply due to their stunning beauty, intricate structure, and the dynamic nature of this awe-inspiring display. They constantly evolve and interact with Saturn's gravitational forces and its numerous moons. Webb's near-infrared camera, NIRCAM, was used to make this observation. Saturn itself appears quite dark in infrared, and that's because the trace amounts of methane in its atmosphere absorbs a huge amount of sunlight hitting it. The ring system, on the other hand, is a totally different story. Given that they are made up from mostly icy material, they simply shine and glow. And the even better news is that scientists are actually working on taking more deep exposures of Saturn that will help us have a clear look at the faintest part parts of this system, areas such as the very thin and faint G and E rings that we can't even see in this picture. So after a few lengthy delays, Ariane Space finally launched the Ariane 5 for the very last time when it completed its 117th mission. After 27 years in service, it screamed through Max-Q for the final time with these two large satellites stacked within the fairings destined for a geostationary transfer orbit. This is the end of an era for Ariane Space because the Ariane 5 is indeed regarded as one of the most reliable heavy lifter launch vehicles in the world. And you can see it in the stream and the vibe from the ground, a mixture of excitement and sadness as the last ever launch cruised through the sky. It has launched some of the most memorable missions. The James Webb Space Telescope is certainly the most epic, but think of the many others. You've got the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. We were talking just last week about Bepi Colombo. We've got ESA's Rosetta mission and so, so many more, all launched on Ariane 5. In this final mission though, the two satellites and the associated deployment equipment weighed in at around 7,680 kilograms. 
As is usually the case, the deployments were shown as animations. They actually have this cylinder adapter which supports the upper satellite and covers the lower one. The first payload to be deployed was the H2SAT and that's going to provide secure and direct communications for the German armed forces. After facing away, the adapter was then jettisoned, followed by the Syracuse 4B satellite. This one is a military communication satellite and it's going to join Syracuse 4A, launched in October of 2021. It was a beautiful mission and although it's sad to see the end of Ariane 5 go, Ariane 6 will soon be ready to take its place, hopefully launching on its first flight early next year. Now, while on the topic of Ariane space, it seems that the Vega C is now grounded, and this is due to a failure during the static fire test of a recent Zephyro 40 second stage engine. Last week, this test was supposed to last 97 seconds, but the engine shut down as it lost pressure after only 40 seconds. Now, this static fire was performed to qualify a new carbon throat nozzle replacement, which took the place of a faulty one blamed for the failure of the launch in December of 2022. Too. Of course, successfully completing this test was a requirement for the Vega C to be cleared to return to flight. So further investigation and testing is going to be conducted by AVO and ESA. It is therefore unlikely that it will return to flight this year. So that is about it for the week, my friends. Thank you for making it all the way to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, please hit those like and subscribe buttons so that we can keep the cycle going. If you would like to help more directly like all the many, many incredible people here, all of these support options make a colossal difference to the team and I. If you want to continue with more space goodness, the algorithm thinks that you will enjoy this video here next, or maybe these videos right there. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video.